Yields down, stocks up. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. Your equity market firmer by about a third of 1% on the S&P. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Live from New York, coming up, retail sales disappoint as inflation softens, Microsoft planning another round of job cuts, and United Airlines delivers a beat and a raise. We begin with the big issue, recession or recovery. We have amongst investors a very, very different view. We're going to have a recession or the economic recovery. On um, one hand, if we're going to recession, bond yields at the longer end of the curve are still too high. Perhaps there's a little bit too much complacency on what central banks are going to do. If we're not going to recession, then it's kind of the opposite. New dry lease to start the year. A lot of optimism on demand. Certainly our core call is that we're rallying into recovery. Every piece of data comes in, we're going to, it's going to tell us Part of the story. We think that you're you're going to get a recession. It really does depend where you look. We hope that the Fed will engineer a soft landing here in the U.S. This has the signs of being a soft landing. But the jury is still out. Mike McKee, that debate is wide open this morning. It is. And if retail sales is a canary in a coal mine, that canary just choked and fell off its perch because retail sales were pretty bad during the month of December. Surprisingly bad, down 1.1 percent more than forecast. The control group, which is what goes into GDP, even worse, down seven tenths of a percent. You look at PPI, it comes in down. Inflation really seems to be falling, and the core for PPI also sequentially lower. So the Fed likes to see the second two numbers, the first two not what they've been expecting. Here's why we saw a big drop in retail sales. Car sales we knew were down, down 1.2 percent, not as bad as November, but still down. And gasoline prices really, really fell. Now, the interesting thing here is that has a big effect on retail sales but gasoline prices have started to go up again. Remember, retail sales denominated in dollar volume. Grocery prices falling a little bit, so grocery sales flat. Look at what happened to department stores. Didn't anybody go out and spend money for the holidays uh, on gifts? Non-store retailers also suffering, also a bit of a surprise. Amazon maybe not doing as well as people thought. Eating and drinking places, the ultimate discretionary, down nine-tenths. People stopped going out at least in uh, the month of December, it appears. In terms of uh, the PPI, here's something interesting. Goods prices deflation now, down 1.6% during the month. The Fed has been talking about goods prices falling and inflation falling away there. That's what's happening. And services prices actually decline on a sequential basis, so that is good. And the core, which is ex-food, energy, uh, and trade services, which is basically the margins for retailers, up only one tenth of 8%. So from the PPI standpoint, we're seeing a real drop in inflation. But at the same time, is the economy weakening? That's going to be the debate. Mike McKee, Fed speak a little bit later. Bostic in just a moment. A little bit later this afternoon. Harker, then Logan. Are we leaning towards 25 in early Feb? 25 seems to be kind of locked in at this point. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any reason why the Fed would need to do 50 unless you're convinced you have to go there and it's better to get it over with at first. But I think this retail sales number is a bit of a warning uh, that the Fed needs to be careful as it gets closer to 5 percent. So they'll probably do 25, not ruling out another 25 at the next meeting. Mike McKay, stay close. We'll catch up in the next 10 minutes or so. Back with us, TD's Priya Misra, TPW's Jay Poloski. It has been a while, Jay, so welcome back to the show. Priya, I want to catch up with you straight away. Retail sales data, PPI, about 33 minutes ago. Your response to it? So I think retail sales suggest that the consumer is slowing. But I will caution, I mean, it's goods consumption largely. We know that the consumer is moving away from goods to services. I mean, is the economy slowing? Absolutely. Is the consumer slowing? Yes. I think that that savings, accumulated savings that we've been highlighting, that's been coming off. But I would say this is the intended consequence of Fed tightening. I mean, they want demand destruction. They are seeing that demand destruction. I think the recession talk, um, I, I do think, the, uh, you know, in our base case, a recession happens in the second half of the year. 
But I don't think the Fed stops. I mean, they may go 25 next meeting. Um, we're actually calling for 50. They can go 25. I think their focus has to be that terminal rate, that above 5% terminal rate. So the market that I think is looking at the weakening consumer, the fact that inflation seems to have peaked and saying maybe one more 25, maximum two more 25. I think the market's too optimistic in terms of how quickly the Fed might stop hiking and start cutting rates. I think they're really far from cutting rates. The idea that the stock market can rally on weak numbers, that I really struggle with. I think the bond market is starting to get nervous about this recession later in the year. And, and that's why you're seeing uh, you know, longer end uh, interest rates really lead the decline in, uh, in the Well, let's be clear. Rates. This market's rallying hard abroad as well. EM equities, Euro stocks 50. The Euro stocks 50 before today. On the year so far, year to date, the Euro stocks 50 is up more than 10%. EM equities up about 8%. The much followed Golden Dragon China index up by 16% year to date. You can take your pick. Jay Piloski, this is your world. Now you tell me, recession or recovery, what should we be pricing here? I'll tell you, John, we own all three and we're happy to do so. And we have for quite some time and uh, we'll continue to do so. Um, no recession, uh, inflation uh, coming down, Fed raises 25 in February, then goes on an extended pause. Uh, we agree with uh, Trita that the Fed is not likely to cut rates um, because there's not going to be a recession. And the real key here, John, are, are two things. First, uh, the, tail, the headwinds of 2022, inflation spike, rate spike, Fed action, are turning into the tailwinds of 23. Inflation rolling over, rates coming down, Fed going on hold, volatility declines, the dollar weakens, the rest of the world starts to pick up. Europe led the way with the halving of natural gas prices last fall. I wrote a piece uh, that, I, that I titled, Things I Don't Understand. And one of them was that uh, European natural gas prices had halved, but European assets didn't react at all. We've obviously seen, as you pointed out, uh, that's changed. And more recently, and I think more importantly for the global economy and global markets, is the about face that China has done on zero COVID. This is the single biggest, most important positive thing for the global economy one could ask for. It puts paid to the idea of a global recession. And I think it suggests that emerging markets are the place to be. We were very keen on Europe last year. We're now very keen on emerging markets and, in particular, very keen on Asia as a geographical region. And for a lot of people who had recession baked in for this year, they're now pushing that back. They're pushing back on it big time in some places. Mike Gapen of B of A in the last 24 hours pushing back as well. He said the following, our outlook still includes a mild recession, but we now expect it to start later and come with lower peak unemployment too. The cause of the delayed downturn is consumer spending, which has been stronger than anticipated. Now, there might be a question mark on that with this retail sales data this morning. Priya, would you push back the recession call as well? When you and I last spoke, you were talking 550 on Fed funds, curve inversion all year, and recession in the second half of 23. Can you talk to me about the third point? Is it still recession in the second half of 23? It, it's still recession. You know, I look at real rates. So if you look at real rates across the curve, they're very high. I mean, we look at the 10-year that's gone from, you know, above 4% to now below 350. It's all been a break-even led move. Those real rates are still very tight. To me, that tightens financial conditions. I know, you know, equities are, and, and others have, have outperformed, but we've had significant tightening in financial conditions from a real rate standpoint. That's still putting pressure on the consumer. And that accumulated savings buffer, you know, the consumer still has savings, but it's coming down really fast. You know, wages are high, but they're not keeping up with inflation. By the middle of the year, we think that savings buffer goes away. The tighter financial conditions, no savings. The moment the job market starts to turn, I, th I think consumer spending really nosedives. So, you know, is it third quarter, fourth quarter, you know, I that's a harder one to call. But second half of the year, we do think that recession comes in. And then it's going to get really tricky for the Fed. Do they respond? You know, they're looking for the unemployment rate at 4.6. We actually don't think we'll be much higher than 4.6. And the Fed, I think, then says, look, inflation's still too high. The unemployment rate is not that high. We're going to stay put. And I think that's going to be really tough for the market, especially risk assets that are looking for that Fed put. The moment we hit a recession, 
I think that Fed put is much further out. We're looking for all these rate cuts really in 24 rather than 23. So now we're still looking for that slowdown because, you know, I think we can look at uh, the equity market, but look at the housing market. That's slowing pretty sharply, real rates. I, you know, I think all the headwinds for the, the consumer are still very much there. This whole curve sinking this morning. We're down 10 basis points on a two-year to 4.1%. Just broke that level. Your 10-year yield down about 15 basis points to 340. What Pri is talking about here, one of the reasons why Marko Kalanovic over at JP Morgan is still cautious on risk. He says this, we remain cautious on risk assets. We're reluctant to chase the past week's rally as recession and over-tightening risk remain high. A lot of good news is already in the price in terms of inflation moderation or the potential for a soft landing. So this is uh, one for you, Jay. So, Jay, you're in a different position because you were already in the trade and this trade is performing. So the decision you've got to make is whether you stick with it or get out. For people like Marco who haven't been riding this wave, although he does like EM and does like China too, they've got a different decision to make. Do they chase it? Do they get in? What do you say to those people that are on the sidelines here, Jay, that have missed out on this rally in the first couple of weeks of 23? Well, there are many of those people, uh, right, John? And that's where the majority of people are. And the narrative has shifted so quickly. And, you know, we've been all about speed for the last couple of years here at TPW Advisory. COVID speed, climate speed, conflict speed, now narrative speed. The narrative has shifted. Most people are behind the curve. Um, look, near term, very near term, things are overbought. If you look at China, if you look at EM, if you look at European banks, they're overbought. So you wait for any kind of pullback, and there's always a pullback. Uh, who knows why? It will happen. And then you need to get in um, with both feet, because I think this is uh, the, the th things have changed. We're now in, in a different direction. I don't disagree with the outlook uh, that was just given on U.S. equities, right? We're looking for a flattish type year. And I'd remind people that a flat type S&P with a weak dollar is the most positive environment possible for non-U.S. equity. And we believe we're at the beginning of a multi-year bull run for non-U.S. equity versus the U.S. And I just would lay out two reasons why. First, on China. It's really important to understand that it's not just a shift off of zero COVID. China has shifted economic policy. No more bashing tech companies. No more three red lines for property developers. And they're pulling back on their wolf warrior diplomacy, reassigning the wolf warriors to some, you know, godforsaken place to do nothing. So this is a sea change in China. China is going for growth. They have the ability uh, to do so. And the second issue is that weak dollar. The weak dollar really drives uh, the non-U.S. Uh, equity markets. And we think there's opportunity across the board in Japan, in China, in Brazil, debt and equity. We have about 20 percent, 20 percent, John, of our global multi-asset model portfolio in emerging market debt and equity. Wow. It's the most books I've been on EM in years and years. But it's backed up by the price action now, Jay, in a big, big way in the last couple of weeks. Equities this morning, just a little bit firmer. Priya, you and I need to talk about this rally of the bond market. The 10 years down to 340. Brief break of that. Your two year at 410. Brief break of that as well. We're down 10 basis points at the front end of the curve. We're down about 14 or 15 on a 10 year. Priya, can you tell me where you are now on treasuries? And can you tell me what you think of this move this morning? Sure. So I think the move today was was partly retail sales, partly also BOJ. I mean, last night, the BOJ did not move yield curve control. I actually think it's inevitable. They're going to have to give up on yield curve control. You know, it didn't happen last night. It's likely to happen by April. They're going to get a new BOJ governor as well. You know, there's a global reflation trade. Japan has also seen, um, you know, higher inflation, higher wages in our view. They're going to have to give up on it. And so I think term premium or, you know, this, this demand for treasuries that's come from from the Japanese investor base, that's going to be less. So I think that's putting some upward pressure on rates. But then we've got this issue in the US where the market's pricing in a recession. I think bonds are a very good diversifier here. If the economy is going to go into a recession, longer term treasuries, I mean, our forecast is 285 for the 10 year by the end of the year. You know, has, has it happened really fast? Yes, I think the market's taken the inflation decline, the fact that the consumer is slowing too hard and is pricing that in. I don't think it's going to be a straight line down to 285. I actually think in the near term, we can rise a bit in yield. As the Fed says, hold on, we are trying to slow things down and you know this is intended and we're not going to stop our hiking because inflation core services ex shelter 
is still high. It's still accelerating, as we saw last week in the CPI report. So I think not a straight line down, but I do think the longer term trend for long term treasuries is lower and particularly real rates. Look at those 10 year real rates, well north of 1%. The economy can't handle north of 1% uh, you know, long term real rates. So I think the, the, the long term trade is lower 10 year rates in the two handle by the end of the year. Near term, I do think the market might be a little too excited that the Fed is done. I think we're going to hear from a lot of Fed officials and they're going to say, no, no, we, st we can hike at a slower pace, but we still have to keep going. We have to go above 5%. That's not priced. And so I see volatility. It's a less liquid market. I see interest rates rising in the near term, but I think the trend is still towards, you know, people buying bonds here for that recession because at least the inflation fear seems to be a lot less this year. Well, they're certainly piling into bonds right now. Priya, Jay, you're going to be sticking with us. We're going to talk about the BOJ in just a moment. Just getting news from Microsoft. Microsoft to slash 10,000 jobs through the end of 3Q. 2023. There was some indication of that from reporting yesterday from Sky News in the UK that it could be 11,000 jobs. That number is 10,000. Microsoft has slashed 10,000 jobs through the end of Q3 2023. We're going to pick up on that story in just a moment and we're going to talk about the BOJ pushing back on speculation. The Bank of Japan likes to surprise investors. However, they are on an unsustainable path and what they did during the holidays, he has opened Pandora's box. The latest on the Bank of Japan and the latest on that headline from Microsoft to slash 10,000 jobs through the end of 3Q23. All of that coming up next. Breaking news just moments ago on Microsoft. Kaylee Lines has more. Hey, Kaylee. Yep, 10,000 jobs being cut by Microsoft, or roughly 5% of the company's workforce. And the company will take a rather large charge in relation to this of about $1.2 billion in the second quarter. That's about a 12 cent negative impact to earnings per share, according to Microsoft. Remember, Bloomberg reported yesterday that Microsoft was planning to cut jobs in engineering divisions today. Now we have a better understanding, perhaps, of the magnitude of those cuts. And just on that magnitude, John, remember, Microsoft already has been trimming back its workforce. It cut about 1% of its 200,000 person workforce in October and also in July. Obviously, these cuts today with about 5% of the workforce are much larger. The company also taking action on the real estate footprint. Microsoft is consolidating its leases to create higher density offices. And we heard from the CEO Satya Nadella at the World Economic Forum in Davos today talking, frankly, about softening demand, how they are going to have to do more with less. It seems to be about efficiency, John. And for Microsoft, that means 10 10,000 job cuts are planned for the company. Hey, Kaylee, thank you. We'll pick up on that story around the open and bounce. Some breaking economic data as well just moments ago. Mike McKee has that. Hey, Mike. John, more bad news on the uh, e economic growth front, and that is uh, the industrial production numbers for the month of December just out from the Fed down uh, on the month by seven-tenths of a percent. That's uh, much worse than had been anticipated. A uh, tenth of a percent decline was what had been anticipated. And manufacturing, the manufacturing part of that uh, is down 1.3 percent. That is uh, much higher than the two-tenths percent that had been forecast. Capacity utilization falls to 78.8 percent, notable because that certainly takes off more inflationary pressure. So at this point, uh, it looks like uh, demand destruction, as Priya was talking about a few minutes yep. ago, is still underway. And Mike, thank you. Two stories here, the softer data in America and the layoffs from Microsoft. So let's go to the former, then we'll get to the latter. Priya, first to you, just on that softer IP data from moments ago, your response. Sure. I think manufacturing is in a recession. I mean, we're seeing this in ISM, all the regional PMIs data, but the U.S. is still a service economy and service consumption is still OK. It is slowing, but I think the Fed wants it to slow. I mean, I think it's going to slow a lot more as, as the consumer you know, deals with a, with a lo lower uh, uh, accumulated savings. But the manufacturing sector clearly in a slowdown. We're watching services spending. We're watching service employment. The U.S. is 75 percent services. So I think that's what we should all be focused on. And it's clearly slowing. Manufacturing in recession is tech in recession. This was Satya Nadella of Microsoft a little bit earlier today in Davos, Switzerland. During the pandemic, there was rapid acceleration. I think we're going to go through a phase today where there is some amount of normalization in demand. We will have to do more with less. We will have to show our own productivity gains with our own technology. 
those comments just ahead of that announcement that 10,000 jobs will go. That stock is up by eight tenths of 1%. Guggenheim actually downgraded the stock just yesterday. That was the first bearish call we've seen on this name in three years. And here was the quote from the analyst. While most investors see Microsoft as a large stable business that can weather any storm, it does have vulnerabilities, some of which could be exacerbated by this macro slowdown. The analyst went on to say, we're in a prolonged macro slowdown and no one is immune. Jay, can I finish with you just on that? The cyclical challenge these big tech names are going to face in America and beyond. Yeah, John, we're, we're, we've not been positive on big tech for, I don't know, a year, year and a half. Uh, high rates, uh, are kryptonite for, for growth stocks. Uh, so that's not an area where we've been focused. We're in, we're in value. We're in small caps. We're in cyclicals. We like financials. We like industrials uh, globally. Um, and I think Japan is actually showing that the world is moving to a higher nominal growth plane. You may recall that high nominal growth thesis uh, because we talked about it a bunch over the course of 2022. I think Japan is just confirming that. And we look for a global CapEx boom over the next couple of years to deal with the three C's of COVID, climate, and conflict with both public and private spending to support that. So we're pretty optimistic. And with the U.S. data being negative, that just feeds our case, right? We're overweight non-U.S. equity. You know, U.S. news that's not great is okay for us because it, re it re reaffirms the weak dollar. And the weak dollar is really the thing that we're focused on here. A weak dollar drives money and flows into non-U.S. assets. And that's what we're seeing. And, John, as you know, it's been about a 12-year run since the bottom in 2009 yep. for U.S. assets, led by big tech. That whole trade is unwinding. It's going to take years for that to happen. We're in the very first inning of what, I as I said earlier, a multi-year period of non-U.S. equity outperformance led by both developed markets like Europe and Japan. We're double-weighted in Japan equity and emerging markets led by places like China, Brazil, etc. Well, Jay, it took a while, but the world is coming towards you, at least for the first couple of weeks of 23. I promise you a victory lap. Jay Poloski there. Priya, wonderful to hear from you, as always. Priya Misra there. Coming up later, Pimco's Erin Brown. from New York City. Good morning to you. Busy morning so far. Equity futures just about positive by a third of 1% on the S&P. The story so far this morning, the wrong kind of downside surprise on retail sales, the right kind of downside surprise on PPI, and then IP, industrial production, comes in a little bit softer too. Equities, with that, up higher this morning on the S&P and on the Nasdaq, on the Nasdaq by six tenths of 1%. That's where the bond market switch to the board get to the bond market. We look a little something like this. Your 10-year yield lower by 16 basis points. Your 10-year, 338.98 on a 10-year right now. A break of 340, a big rally in the bond market. This whole yield curve just sinking lower. Dollar weaker, euro dollar, 108.80. Euro dollar positive, 8 or 9 tenths of 1%. And crude up by a little more than 2%. $81.97, let's call it 82 That rally continues on crude. About 25 seconds into the session, a broader equity market looks like this on the S&P, up a third of 1%. On the Nasdaq, up seven tenths of 1%. One stock to watch at the open, United Airlines. Recession, what recession? It's a B and a raise of guidance as well. The CEO, Scott Kirby, saying this, we managed through one of the worst weather events in my career. We're now poised to accelerate in 23. Kelly has more. Hey, Kelly. Hey, John. Well, the stock's certainly accelerating this morning. It's up about three, nearly 4% at the opening bell and taking its airline peers along for the ride as well. You have Delta and American each higher by more than 2% and even Southwest, which is the one that really struggled with that winter weather. Scott Kirby mentioned is higher by about 1.4%. This print for United came in way better than expected, not just in terms of the fourth quarter, but the guidance handily topped estimates for the fiscal first quarter. The company is expecting earnings of between 50 cents and a dollar a share. That is more than double the analyst estimate of 22 cents a share at the low end, more than quadruple it at the high end and the full year earnings guidance of between 10 and 12 dollars a share also blew past expectations. So really, really strong guidance and it really all comes down to pricing power because of the remaining mismatch between supply and capacity and demand. That is why United and other airlines have been charging all of us high fares. That's a bummer for us, but it helps them 
when it comes to the bottom line. Just for United, the average fare per mile climbed 20.8 percent from 2019 levels in the quarter just reported. So that yield strength is really what is driving things. And in turn, it has helped drive the stock higher. United this morning is trading at its highest level in roughly a year and a half since mid 2021. But just keep in mind, we still remain well below the levels at which this stock was trading pre pandemic. It was north of $80 a share back at the end of 2019. This morning, it's trading around $52. You're trying to recover now. Katie, thank you. Year to date, though, what a move up 38% year to date on that single name. And I say year to date, what are we 10, 11, 12 trading days hmm. into the year so far? Another company on a victory lap is Moderna, the drug maker's RSV vaccine, proving highly effective in its final stage trial. The CEO said the following What we have is a very good vaccine with very strong efficacy to mild disease. Katie Greifout has more. Hey, Katie. Hey, John. Well, traders are definitely cheering those trial results as well. You have Moderna shares up about 7% from the bell. And of course, this sets up a three-way competition for an RSV vaccine with other drug makers such as GSK and Pfizer. Pre-market, not as much action from them as for Moderna. But remember, both of those companies applied for U.S. clearance for their own vaccines last year. So let's dig into those results. We're looking at vaccine efficacy for less severe RSV cases. You can see that Moderna shot blocked about 84 percent of case cases in that phase three trial. That's slightly ahead of GSK and well ahead of Pfizer and JP Morgan came out and said that overall this Moderna vaccine it compares well to Pfizer and is competitive with GSK and of course this is crucial to Moderna's bottom line obviously we know that COVID was a huge boom for this drug maker sales went from 60 million dollars in 2019 to an estimated 19 billion dollars in 2022 but you can see expected to drop off to about 8 billion dollars this year John so that pipeline is key. Katie thank you the latest on Moderna the stock up by more than 7%. Let's turn to tech. The layoffs continue. Microsoft planning to cut 10,000 jobs through 3Q and Amazon starting to cut 18,000. Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella speaking this morning saying during the pandemic there was rapid acceleration. I think we're going to go through a phase today where there is some amount of normalization in demand. We will have to do more with less. Ed Ludlow on the West Coast with more. Morning Ed. Yeah, good morning, John. Microsoft up three tenths of one percent, pairing some of its early gains in the session. Ten thousand job cuts for Microsoft would amount to around five percent of the workforce. That's probably more than we we're envisaging. Remember, Bloomberg only reported 24 hours ago that these cuts would focus in engineering. Uh, in terms of how this impacts Microsoft, the negative impact to EPS of 12 cents uh, in the fiscal second quarter, which they should report at the end of this month. Another way of putting it, it's a 1.2 billion dollar charge. Layoffs are never pleasant, but investors seem to be cheering this news at least, although it's sort of trading in line with market. Amazon, much more significant gains, up 1.8 percent. We knew these layoffs from Amazon were coming. They're already announced 18,000 jobs, which is 1 percent of Amazon's overall workforce, including contractors, but a higher proportion of corporate workers, around 6 percent. So far, those layoffs at Amazon have focused on the devices business. Our understanding is that that when they start the process of cutting those jobs on Wednesday, from Wednesday onwards, that it actually will expand to the retail and other marketing divisions of the company as well. In terms of what that means for this earnings season, right, I think that these are the EPS expectations or consensus for the last three months of 2022. Uh, there may be some change in that, of course, given the actions that some of these companies have, ta uh, have taken. But, you, you know, you and I talked 24 hours ago. We're probably coming out of an earnings trough when we get reports for the final three months of 2022. Beyond that, I think we're asking ourselves uh, what the, the sort of longer term and health of this industry is. If not a, an economic recession globally, what does an earnings recession look like? And without these actions, can you cut your way out of an economic uh, downturn? That really is the question for Silicon Valley and global tech right now. Uh, the news this morning is Microsoft. I want to just sit on Amazon a little bit longer. Yeah. This is a company in 2019, as you know, had just short of 800,000 employees. A couple of years later, it had 1.6 yes. million. It's come down since then. But I just wonder, Ed, does 18,000 get it done for that company, given the challenges that they're going to face? <sighs> Yeah, look, look, you look at the, the, the commentary from Andy Jassy. He's talked about how Amazon has survived economic downturns in the past, and they'll do so again. 18,000 jobs is the biggest cuts that Amazon's ever taken. The other way I'd look at it is that this is Andy Jassy kind of unwinding some of the pandemic era investments that Jeff Bezos met, made, right? They invested billions of dollars to increase their fulfillment capacity, hired many workers just to handle that pandemic era demand. Uh, that's not there anymore, you know. 
the, the movement of packages and goods, particularly in North America, is just not at that same level. So it's an unwinding of a, of a base that's no longer required. Ed, thank you, mate. Looking forward to the coverage of the earnings over the next couple of weeks, starting with Netflix this week, then on to Microsoft next week, then early February, we'll hear from Apple and all the rest. Just getting some comments from the St. Louis Fed President, Jim Bullard, non-voter this year on the FOMC, but a lot of people still follow his thoughts. He's speaking at an event held by the Wall Street Journal. He says his 23 rate projection in December was for 525 to 550. Went on to say policy is almost restrictive. You've heard that phrase a, full time, a few times in the last month or so. Are we at sufficiently restrictive rates? It's not quite there yet, is the takeaway from Jim Bullard. We need rates above 5% to continue to push inflation down. He wants Fed policy to err on the tighter side as insurance. So the decision, and I guess the challenge we're all facing this year in this market, are we trying to price in a growth slowdown off the back of monetary policy tightening and a Fed that's trying to get sufficiently restrictive? Or are we trying to price in a global growth recovery off the back of China reopening? This is what PIMCO's Erin Brown's got to say on the matter. China's reopening should drive out performance this year in China. This will also help European equities. U.S. stocks with international exposure should outperform more domestically oriented stocks, particularly as the U.S. enters a recession. This favours U.S. large caps over small. Erin, I'm pleased to say, joins us right now. Erin, fantastic to catch up with you. Let's talk about the gains we've already had. Big gains in Europe. Big gains in EM. Big gains in parts of the Chinese equity market. Why do you think these tailwinds are strong enough to overcome some of the headwinds out there? So overall, I still am fairly pessimistic on the overall outlook for equities, but I think that there's going to be pockets of growth that should outperform. And I think you're going to see more differentiation this year versus what we saw in 2022. And so specifically, I think that those names that are really geared towards Asia and the China reopening story are going to be the places that are going to outperform and where you really want to hone in on your bets. And so there are names in the U.S. that I think should do well, some of the luxury names um, specifically you know, geared names to international travel and, and some of the hotel and leisure names should outperform. And then I even think some of the tech sector should also start to do well, particularly given the fact that duration we're now starting to see or rates are starting to move lower. That should help to support, you know, those long duration bets in the technology sector. And I think that you'll start to see those names do better. So anything that's really geared outside of the U.S., which most have most, more of its sales and revenue streams from international uh, exposure, I think are going to outperform the U.S. as it heads into the recession. So three buckets there, airlines, potentially, luxury, potentially. And then you've got U.S. tech on the third point. I want to get to U.S. tech in just a moment. Can we talk about the airlines first? Airlines year to date, United up 37 percent, American Airlines up 37 percent, JetBlue even up 31 percent. I'm not sure about their international exposure. So Aaron, that raises the question, is this a flash in the pan, a bear market rally? What is this on the screen? Yeah, so when I, when I talk about travel, it's not just airlines. It's some of the more hotel and, and leisure companies as well. And I really look to those with more international exposure than the U.S. airlines, which I think are experiencing a little bit of a bounce just given the strong demand and sort of, you know, um, that we saw, you know, throughout the, the end of, the, of last year, as well as how well they've operated, um, you, know, th you know, despite challenges um, in, in the second half of last year. But I think when you really want to focus on is more of the um, service-oriented and leisure-oriented travel names that, and hotel names outside of, you know, just airlines. So the luxury players as well. The luxury players absolutely flying. You mentioned that LVMH up 18% year to date. MS up by 15, 16% year to date. Kering up by about the same amount. Kering up by 15% as well. Year to date. I keep saying year to date. Can we just remember it's January 18th? So year to date is just a couple of weeks. Erin, the one thing I wanted to discuss with you as well is tech. So Microsoft just come out and made its job cuts. Could be in and around 5% of the company. Guggenheim downgraded the stock yesterday. And I want to talk to you about this quote from them. They said, while most investors see this name as a large, stable business that can weather any storm, it does have vulnerabilities, some of which could be exacerbated by the macro slowdown. We are in a prolonged macro slowdown and no one is immune. Erin, can you just walk me through your expectations for this recession in the United States and how it stacks up with maybe part of the equity market, part of the tech sector that is more cyclically challenged than some people might appreciate? 
So I think that's right, but I think that that played out through most of 2022, and you saw material underperformance of the tech names on the back of, first, a slowdown in overall demand, and secondarily, higher interest rates. And now we're starting to see that a very, you know, much more severe slowdown is priced in in the tech se sector versus what we're seeing across other cyclical sectors. And in addition to that, we're now seeing duration or treasuries, you know, stop increasing in, in terms of rate level, and we're starting to see them actually rally and yields go back down lower. And so I think just given the fact that a pretty severe uh, outlook for revenue growth is already priced into many of these names, um, and the fact that we're starting to see duration start to move in favor of treasuries, I actually, or move in favor of the tech sector, I actually think that the tech sector is, is one of the few sectors that is really discounting a recession in its outlook. So yields have been coming down recently. They're down again this morning. I've got the 10-year down 16 basis points. I just wonder, I've asked this question a few times this week, Aaron. I'd love your view on it. For the same reasons we're bullish on the global economy, relatively speaking off the back of this China reopening, aren't they also reasons to challenge this view that yields should go lower? Well, I don't think that we should be necessarily bullish on the U.S. outlook for the economy for 2023. I do think that the U.S. is heading into a mild recession or moderate recession throughout the course of this year, and we've seen it in the numbers this morning. Yeah. That should give pause to the Fed interest rate hiking cycle. Uh, after, you know, the next couple of meetings. And so I do think that, you know, we'll likely see 50 basis points more of rate hikes, and that should be the end, uh, absent, you know, a significant uh, spike in inflation. I think that the market's largely discounted that, the, you know, the rate hiking cycle. And as we start to see inflation move lower, um, as we saw again this morning with the PPI print, I do think that you'll likely see rates move lower uh, and the expectation that you know, the Fed is done. And that, I think, is what's sort of underpinning some of the optimism, at least that I have, for the tech sector and for any you know, interest rate set, uh, sensitive sectors. Sure, you know, just to broadly. be super specific, though, on what I meant by what this could mean for the bond market, we're pricing in a global mm -hmm. recovery off the back of this China reopening. That's reflected in what we're seeing in the luxury names, reflected in EM, reflected in European equities. And I'm trying to wonder how much of a factor that will be in the US bond market. So in the Treasury market this morning, we're responding to softer data, Treasury's up, yields lower. But if we're also pricing in a better recovery abroad, driven by China, what do you think that ultimately means for the trajectory of bond yields? So I actually don't think it means that much. I don't think that you're going to see large economic spillover effects from China to the rest of the world. You'll see it in certain equity sectors, um, but it's going to be very specific. And what I think is different this time around than what we've seen in past you know, significant sort of rebounds in China is that historically the rebounds in China have largely been driven by big industrial production um, gains, which were felt from a ripple effect perspective, you know, across emerging markets, across commodity sectors, across, you know, more cyclically oriented sectors. This time around, I think the reopening is going to be very specifically limited to China domestically um, and to, you know, Ch China demand for more service oriented goods. And so as opposed to when you've seen it in the past, which were more industrial led, this time around it's going to be more in consumer led and it's going to be really geared towards, you know, uh, travel, towards leisure, towards, you know, some luxury goods spending, towards getting back out in the world. And so I think that that differentiation is going to have a materially different impact in terms of what you know sort of the ramifications to the rest of the world and you're probably not going to see the same growth impulse stimulus that we've seen in the past in the US in Europe in you know the rest of the world interesting Aaron great point to leave it on just fantastic as always Aaron Brown there of PIMCO on the latest here's the latest on Microsoft 10,000 jobs to go the stock is just about unchanged on the session Dan Ives of Wedbush bullish on the name said this is a rip the band-aid off moment to preserve margins and cut costs in a softer macro, a strategy the street will continue to applaud as management teams navigate this Category 5 near-term economic storm. Category 5 near-term economic storm and 10,000 jobs to go at Microsoft. More on that through the day on Bloomberg TV and on Bloomberg Radio. Coming up, the US and China pledging to talk more. These meetings are critical. I mean, these are the two largest economies in the world. It's important for the rest of the world that they work closely together.
We'll catch up with AMH down at DC next. shifted economic policy, no more bashing tech companies, no more three red lines for property developers, and they're pulling back on their wolf warrior diplomacy, reassigning the wolf warriors to some, you know, godforsaken place to do nothing. So this is a sea change in China. China is going for growth. They have the ability uh, to do so. It's a shift in tone. Will it lead to a shift in policy? U.S.-China talks picking up in Zurich. Secretary Yellen looking to alleviate tensions in a meeting with her Chinese counterpart, saying we share a responsibility to show that China and the United States can manage our differences and prevent competition from becoming anything ever near conflict. The Vice Premier of China echoing that sentiment, saying no matter how circumstances change, we should always maintain dialogue and exchanges. AMH joins us now in D.C. Amory, did we achieve anything with this? We achieved words, Jonathan, warmer words between these two countries, between Washington and Beijing, but obviously no serious policy breakthroughs. There's a number of very high contentious issues on both of these individuals' agendas coming into this meeting, whether it's trade and technology. Obviously, there's massive disagreements between China and the United States when it comes to things like Taiwan and Ukraine, um, and also debt sustainability. And this, of course, comes before Secretary Yellen heads to Africa, which is going to be a major part of her discussions there. Uh, there's one key thing, though, Jonathan, and this is more of an openness for the, that engagement to continue. And when you look at the Treasury readout, the last sentence it insinuates that Secretary Yellen will be heading to Beijing. It says she looks forward to traveling to China and to welcoming her counterparts to the United States in the near future. So not just Yellen going to China. We also heard yesterday from the State Department Blinken, that very much so trip that we've been expecting. We now have it. It's going to be early February. So you do see the dialogue warmer, but not the policy stances. Abroad, maybe, perhaps not at home. So we've got a conversation abroad about debt sustainability. We're doing the same thing domestically, the debt ceiling deadline approaching on Capitol Hill. The House Speaker, Kevin McCarthy, weighed in on this. Take a listen. What I'd like to do is I'd like to sit down with all the leaders, especially with the president, and start having a discussion. Why wouldn't we sit down and talk, and especially with something as serious as debt, but as serious as a debt limit, why would you want to wait till the end? I don't see why you would continue the past behavior. Does the president want to sit down with him right now, my Marie? Well, the president has said that he is willing to work with anyone. The issue the White House is taking is the fact that they do not want to make a single concession when it comes to the debt ceiling because they say these are debts that are paid for past legislatures. These are past Congress decisions, and that the United States is not going to pay fast and loose with whether or not they can pay off their debts. So right now, Jonathan, you have just a classic standoff, which we've seen in the past. The issue, what people are starting to get concerned about, a la 2011, is potentially a downgrade because it's going to come so close to the brink because what we've already seen from this Congress, which is the fact that a few people can take control, especially when they couldn't elect a speaker. In a major way. AMH, thank you. Down in D.C., thank you very much. Just to get you up to speed, equities look like this, up four-tenths of one percent on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, higher by about eight-tenths of one percent. This rally in the bond market off the back of weak economic data, the rally in the bond market continues down 11 basis points on a two-year to just north of 4.1 per cent. Your 10-year, 4.33 back in October, right now on the 10-year, a break of 3.40. So we're in the 3.30s now, move of almost 100 basis points. Up next, your trading diary. Twenty-six minutes into the session, just about firmer by a third of one percent. Really impressive rally taking place in the bond market off the back of less than impressive economic data this morning. Downside surprise on retail sales, on industrial production. And inflation coming a little bit softer, encouraging some of these moves as well in the bond market. That's the price action. Here's the trading diary. The Fed's beige book, 2 p.m. Eastern. Fed speak picks up with Harker and Logan on deck. We'll hear from Collins, Brainerd, Williams all on Thursday. Another round of jobless claims in the morning. Netflix kicks off big tech earnings in the afternoon. Finally, we close out a week on Friday with existing home sales. From New York, that does it for me. Thank you for choosing Bloomberg TV. This was the countdown to the open. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.